everyone, it's Young Boys, New Humans of Eurovision Show, 25th episode, and this special anniversary I will celebrate with Josh Martin, the head of delegation of Australia at Eurovision, who just recently said that they can't go to Rotterdam personally for very obvious reasons. But we were talking about this all through, how this hard decision was made, how it affects Australia, how Australia actually take Eurovision and how is my approach to Australia or how I see it and we were talking all this through and it's one of the most interesting interviews I've made so far. It's because as well there are so many information you never heard, I've never heard. There is as well a topic which is Australian TV industry, Australian music industry, how it works together, how Eurovision starting to be big at Australia and how that really happened. And this is all what we talk in this interview and you just don't want to miss any of the information there. So please welcome Josh Martin. Hey Josh, how's in Australia? How are you doing? Hi Jan, good evening from Australia. It's uh, seven o'clock in the evening my time and I've just had some dinner. <laughs> well, what do you have? What do you have? Interesting. Is this I had some, uh, meal? Yeah, it was a quick gnocchi. Uh, very nice. <laughs> cool. Bon appetit. Bon appetit. Really, really glad that you're, that you're talking to me, even if you have a dinner right now. So uh, <laughs> just, you know, to let my let my viewers to understand the situation where we are talking right now. It's just a few hours after you announced that you're not going to Rotterdam representing Australia on place. How will you do it and how hard was this to make the decision? Oh, look, it's been an incredibly difficult decision. I mean, uh, you know us, you know us Australians, uh, we do love a party, I think. Um, but the challenges, the challenges for us are unique in getting to Europe uh, in the middle of the global pandemic. Um, there's currently a travel ban uh, from Australia. So Australians actually can't leave the country. We are not allowed to leave the country. Um, there's also very few flights coming and going from Australia. Um, so even if we manage to get to Europe, there's no guarantee we can actually get home. And when we get home, we have to spend two weeks in hotel quarantine uh, at our own expense. Um, and that's it's just been a very, very, very difficult um, decision. Uh, particularly feel for Montaigne, our artist, because, you know, two years in a row now that, sh um, you know, she hasn't been able to perform on that Eurovision stage. So, yeah, it's been heartbreaking. But, um, you know, uh, if any of us have learned anything uh, over the past 12 months, you know, you just got to go, go with the flow and do what you can and, and make the best of it. So, yeah. Very sad that we won't get to see everybody in person. Uh, but yeah, that's that's un the unfortunate decision. Yeah. Yeah, but you but make absolutely sense that you had to make it, and you probably prepared even the plans for it in advance. As it's not just the ad hoc decision anyway, isn't it? Oh gosh, no, no. We spent a lot of time uh, trying to figure out how we could get there. Um, we consulted, you know, external people. We've talked about it endlessly, um, but, uh, you know, so it wasn't an overnight decision. Um, it's something we've been talking about for months, really. Um, and, and look, the Eurovision, uh, the Dutch, uh, the, the, the Dutch broadcasters and the EBU have obviously factored in that, which is why we've all had to do a live on tape performance, um, and so that will be, they've been kind enough to let us submit that as our entry. Um, so we're still competing. We just won't be there in person. And you will be using probably the live on tape performance as well. How, how yes. much focus did you put into live on tape performance? As I heard many stories that some countries didn't really invest too much into it, but you were in a very different situation that you, that you feel that that can happen really, really, actually, and, and it happened. So did you put really, really a lot of, I wouldn't say money, but, you know, 
what was your approach towards the live on tapes? Yeah, look, we um, we we spent a lot of time uh, on the art direction and and the staging uh, that we did for the live on tape. Um, we did everything we could within our means. Um, our the first performance Montaigne uh, did at our Sydney Gay and Lesbian Mardi Gras, which is our official clip. Um, that was the first time she'd performed. And so some of the ideas that we had at that performance have made it into the live on tape, but just some of the ideas, mm -hmm. um, there's, there's obviously more, more to it than that. But look, the thing about it is, um, as you know, you can have incredible staging and spend a, you know, uh, Kate Miller Heidke, who was our, um, entrant in Tel Aviv. Uh, that was fairly epic staging. Um, but Duncan Lawrence with a piano on stage, um, won the competition. So, you know, staging isn't everything. It's about the idea. And, um, Paul Clark, who's, uh, our, uh, who, you know, who's our creative, um, director, um, really worked closely with Montaigne, um, to come up with a, with a, you know, really stylish, really fun, really good, really impactful, live on tape performance. So, um, yeah, we, we thought about it, um, because we always knew it could be a possibility. Um, and we did not have our, um, national final this year either. Um, so we couldn't, we didn't have any, um, vision from a national final to have. So yeah, we gave, we did, we worked hard. Yeah. Yeah. You always do. And I'm really curious how it's going to be, but you're, you're set about the stagings, the epicness of, you know, Kate Miller Heidke or the others. And I just, you know, wrote some, some questions in here. And I was thinking about it a lot of times. I was talking with Paul about this as well, that how I feel Australia at Eurovision since 2015 until now. And I told him something like that you came at Australia as Australians. And at the end of the day in 2020, you were assimilated by Eurovision, like more Eurovision <laughs> Australians kind of, you know, and a bit of losing of what you came in and just becoming more what Eurovision is. And that you just said, you know, the big show, more show and maybe less music kind of, I wouldn't just say it like this, but you maybe you understand what I mean. If you're just compared to Duncan Lawrence, uh, how has your approach changed since then? Or what's Australia now? What's the vision of Australia at Eurovision? How it's the approach? What's the feedback? Look, um, great question. So, you know, we've, we, Australia loves Eurovision. And, and so, um, I've been part of, uh, the Australian delegation now for my first one was, um, a Jessica Malboy mm -hmm. in Lisbon. Um, and prior, and so she was the last internally selected artist we had after Isaiah, after, um, dummy M after, um, Guy Sebastian. And, um, so those early years were really important, um, to, when you join Eurovision, you've got a sort of, you've got a lot of learning to do. And mm -hmm. Paul, Paul Clark and, and the team just did an amazing effort with that. Um, and then it basically, when I, when I came on board, I was very keen to do a national final because you need to keep evolving and you need to keep growing. And, um, so the national final really opened it up, um, to a much broader, range of artists, um, still really high quality artists, but, um, just a different range. And I think what Kate did in Tel Aviv was, uh, was the product of, of that process of a national final. Like we were, we were so proud of that performance and, uh, Kate just did an incredible job. Um, uh, and then following that up in the next year with Montaigne, who again is more of a sort of an independent artist. She, uh, she's very, we have a radio station in, in Australia called Triple J, uh, which is a massive music network, um, a very youth focused network. It's, it's, um, alternative, but it's pop, but it's rock. Uh, it's a bit of everything. Um, and she very much comes from that audience. And so she's now taken it in another direction our Eurovision journey as well. Um, and so I think that's been the power of our national final and for artists in Australia, um, we, 
what there's a couple of things like it's Eurovision. It's the biggest song contest in the world. You have an audience of 200 million people. Um, yeah, it's it's over the top and it's fun and it's um, competitive. Um, and we love all of that sort of side of it. But it's also an amazing opportunity for an artist to get their music out to a broad audience. And, you know, we like everywhere we have the voice and we have, you know, Australia's got talent and all these shows. But they're often cover songs. There's there's not many competitions to this scale that you you have the opportunity to create original music, and so that supports the Australian music industry, which you know, uh, and is is more important than ever before around the world now. With um, you know a lot of the world not being able to um, have uh, live artist performances, so so you know I think what we see it as is a an opportunity to really be creative you know and 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 work with artists to just push their performance you know it's it's you can just push it and push it and nothing's too big (laughs) and i and and the joy and the fun of of doing that is there's nothing else like it in the world and that's what we love about eurovision yeah, we can laugh at it, but we also take it seriously. And, um, and, and I think that's why it has been, that's why there are so many Australian Eurovision fans, you know? Yeah. That's what I really like at Australia since the beginning of actually my first year was 2016 and, and, uh, I just, you know, came in and just saw, you know, many delegations and their approaches and then I saw the Australian delegation and their approach. And I said, like, those guys really take it really seriously with the smile on their face, which is something which is completely Australian, I would say. And I love it because it's very positive, you know, and it's, you know, you're sh- like all you guys sharing. You were always sharing with me your ideas or your feedback. I was really glad that I could always ask, you know, and there was always some good answer to me. No, like, you know, the political answer, but the real answer. It, whether I like it or not, but I, I got it and I really, really appreciate it. But I saw that you kind of want as well this thing and you, as you take it seriously, how you push it. And I kind of fe- thought that you got a bit lost on that you want a bit of more being Eurovision. And I, what I really like that you are super Australian, you know, like you're bringing very different flavor. But maybe that's a process and, you know, it's as you said, you know, it's 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 what... National selection brings an understanding of what it is that where you want to have it in 2022, 23, 24, I don't know. But what's the process in your head? What time you need to to really bring in the Australian artists at the same board to understand really that you're helping actually the music industry and you're the, for them here to have a platform which they can use to get worldwide do you feel the same way? There's an understanding. And I, and I, look, I think um, Kate Miller-Heidke was a real turning point for us uh-huh. because um, pr- prior to that, uh, we had, you know, there was a lot of accusations that we were b- playing it safe, mm-hmm. which well, I, don't, I, didn't I want, find those... Sorry, sorry, just, just um, to be really, really clear, I didn't want to say this. I just wanted to say that you're in this... But you, I, I saw the national selection. Though it was not just her and her performance; it was just many other really nice ones, very different styles, very different stagings, whatever. But what I want to say, and just let's use this as a very huge example. But I think we can talk about Jessica Mabos as well. That doesn't doesn't matter. I think it was more about the effect than you know the whole thing. As you mentioned, Duncan Lawrence with the piano, focus centric on just the song, and that was what I said. The yeah. contrast that this was for me, in my opinion, was most focused on the show, like the show, which is nothing wrong. It's just saying that maybe you, the Australia can offer even more. So what's the plan for next year's in this? So look, I think the approach we take is that we put Australia Decides together. We, you got to remember it's a song contest. So we are always looking for good songs, you know? Um, And then obviously, uh, we, we have a song portal. This is what we've done over the last couple of years and, and people submit songs and, um, you know, we go through and, and, and find some really great ones. Um, but artists are also able to submit their own song uh, and high profile artists. What we try to do 
is put on a good show. Uh, so we, but we do want diversity, like diversity is key for us. And I mean, uh, diversity of ages and song styles and, um, uh, you know, whatever, and, and, and audiences. So, uh, you know, we, it's nice to have artists who might appeal to a particular audience over there. And then another audi- uh, artist that's slightly cooler and appeals to, I don't know, younger people. So we're always looking to, to put on a very diverse show. Um, and we, and look, we have so much fun doing it that we always want to push it. So we've never had, we've only done it two years, but we haven't had a band yet, or we haven't had a, uh, a metal band or a prog rock band, or we haven't had a duet or we haven't had uh, hip hop, or there's so many things we haven't done. And there's no reason why we can't, we won't do those. In fact, I think Paul and I, um, always, yeah, we're, we're always challenging each other. We're, we're, we've been fantastic partners, um, in the time we work together and, uh, and, and it is just about sculpting that terrific Australia decides. And if we get that right, then we know we're going to get a good song for Eurovision and our fans will go along and support it, or they might argue with it or, <laughs> and they do argue about it, as you know, um, and disagree. Um, that's good. You know, a- absolutely. That's about, um, that's what we want. We want engagement with people, you know, and we, we, we do engage with the fans. We read everything. We read all the blogs. We watch all the YouTube shows, you know, so, um, and, and we love getting that feedback, even if we disagree with it at times, but, uh, we love getting that feedback. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, well, <laughs> so that's it. So it can go anywhere. Yeah. And I, I, I really think you, you can. So there are two questions I really are super interested in and the first is like how's your approach to the artist is how does it look like like what's the process behind you know how you really tell the artist this is eurovision this is eurovision decides or australia decides and it's this blah 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 like how do they react how it's difficult for you to get those artists whoever it is like with the diversity as you said styles ages whatever and What's the approach towards the 2022? Because you probably already have some plans in the in the mind. So can you share with me? <laughs> <laughs> um, we <laughs> we are very much concentrating on uh, on uh, Rotterdam at the moment. But I, I'd be lying if we said we hadn't started talking about it. Um, uh, but yeah, look, we. Paul particularly uh, is in constant discussion with record companies. We, we might go and see a show and see uh, a new amazing artist or um, so. So there's always a bit of a mix or there might be people that we've had discussions with over the past two years that the timing didn't work. And they were like, you know, well, can is it can you do it next year? So, yeah, we have. We have started those discussions, but it's very, very, very early days. Mm-hmm. So I don't, yeah, I don't really have anything to share at this point. <laughs> yeah, but tell me, how does this really look like? Like how the artist reacts when you, like how it was in 2019 with your first show, how hard it was to find songs to it and, you know, to, to, to tell them like, oh, you're competing with your own songs. And, you know, it's always hard. Everybody says it's hard on different, of course, it was incredibly hard. It, it, we had never done a national final before and we have, we had great ambition. Um, you know, we, I've been to Melfest, um, and I think that is, as everybody knows, it's one of the biggest uh, national finals. Um, and so we learned a lot, um, from, uh, the producers of Melfest and, and from watching it. Um, and, and also from many other national finals, you know, um, as well. Um, so we wanted, we wanted to put on a great high quality show, uh, and doing it for the first time, you learn a lot, <laughs> you learn a hell of a lot. We made a lot of mistakes, but, um, and, and look, we all worked incredibly hard, um, to do so, but what we heard, what, and this is a massive credit to Paul and the Blink team is that uh, we created such an environment at the Gold Coast um, where all the artists were so happy uh, and and uh, it was a really beautiful environment and so supportive and one of the things we sort of 
um, really reinforce is it, yeah, it's a competition, but um, it's also a competition about songs. So it's, it's not about a competition between the artists. And so um, I think that's a really useful uh, thing to reinforce because um, you might have an amazing artist and maybe that song just didn't resonate that year. It's nothing against the artist personally. Um, so I think that really helps and that, that support um, and collaboration, which you sort of mentioned earlier uh, around um, uh, being at Eurovision. I, th I mean, I think that's one of the things I love about Eurovision is that when, when we all see each other in person um, from 40 different countries, uh, I, that spirit of collaboration, I, I just, I love it. I, I think that's what we all should do, you know, because we're all want to put on a good show and we want to support our artists and uh, the competition is secondary to that in because of course it's important but it's a but you have to give give it everything and you have to um just it's a creative exercise and i think um so i think that first year of australia decides um we created a beautiful atmosphere and the artists really enjoyed themselves. And, and we had some terrific artists there like Courtney Act, who's, who's known around the world. We had Shepard who have also had some big hits. We had uh, Tanya Doko, who, who's, um, you know, it's a big name and a Swedish songwriter. Uh, and we had Kate Miller Heidke. And so we, we, and Electric Fields were, were also an amazing artist, uh, um, amazing group. So we, there was such a good group that first year, then that word gets out to the rest of the industry. And then they saw Kate in Tel Aviv uh, and they go, wow, that's something I've never thought of doing again. But as an artist, um, the opportunity to create a three minute performance um, and where you've, you've, you've got permission to do something that you wouldn't normally do. I think it's really appealing to a lot of artists because they, you know, it's well known. Eurovision is the stage where you get to be who you want to be. And uh, and so I think, you know, the music industry in Australia recognise that this is a great opportunity to have fun, do something different uh, and and get some more fans, you know. So that's kind of our approach. Yeah. So uh, your approach is more like about the one, the, those three minutes to like kind of maybe be indifferent or just being original for those three minutes and then do whatever you want as well in your career or it's just more like this is a platform where you can become as well famous with your songs with the range of songs you have and this is just a continuity with your biggest hit kind of how is this or it's a combination i think it's a combination i mean as you know like it's it's an it's a marathon if you're a eurovision artist like you, you need people who are going to commit to the months of publicity and rehearsals and so there's a lot of work involved um but um so so we always uh we always artists who do want to be part of it we always are very clear with what's involved because they have to they do have to block out about three months of their schedule mm -hmm. which means they can't tour which is often where they earn a lot of their money um so um yeah, for us, it's about, uh, yeah, it's, it, it's cliche, but it is all about the song um, and, and finding finding the right artist um, to sing it. And, you know, uh, yeah. So I don't know if that answers. Yeah, 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 no worries. Yeah. Uh, how's the approach of the, of the music industry in Australia towards the Eurovision Song Contest? Do they recognize it as a opportunity or it's still a process and it's not like how actually is music industry in australia how's it called like collaborative with the sbs or you guys uh making eurovision because in many countries it is like um, the, those two worlds tv world and the you know the music world doesn't really work together don't understand what in stake or what platform is that I think we've, for him? Look, I think it's very healthy in Australia. I think we're very, as I said, I think um, the music industry here recognize the commercial opportunities mm -hmm. um, in promoting an artist to 200 million people. Um, 
And so we have a great relationship with the music industry um, and, and we continue to build that. But I think it comes back to what I said earlier, that this is the only TV show, if you want to talk, you know, think about it like a TV show. It's the only TV show that is about original music, mm -hmm. not, it's not the voice. So, um, so I think that's been a real key for us um, is that it, and that's why we do get a lot of support from the music industry. Um, uh, and if they um, are clever about their artists, then they can leverage that into um, tours and, uh, new, and new albums and, and whatever else it might be. Um, you know, everything is so data driven now as well. It's so, you know, when uh, as a delegation, when, when, um, when you're sort of in that Eurovision week or fortnight where, where everything's coming to a head and there's lots of promo and there's lots of press and there's lots of social media these days, you know, you can open up Spotify or, or Apple music or one of these things. And you can see exactly what country, um, is, is listening to your artists, mm -hmm. um, that week. Um, and you see that immediacy and, you know, our head of press and our press team can then um, try to capitalize on that by making sure, uh, you know, we're doing interviews in, in the Czech Republic or in Spain or, where, or wherever those, um, <laughs> those listens are coming from. Yeah. Um, so, y yeah, it's, um, it's amazing the data that you have at your, your fingertips these days. Um, uh, but... Um, yeah, sorry, I don't know if that answers your question. I yeah, you're just, just rambling it, on. It's, it's a lot of yeah. other answers, I yeah. think, involved. But the conclusion of it is, of course, that you're working greatly with your music industry, which I think it's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing thing. I don't know if, why, why I asked it because I just, you know, could talk about it. But how is it with the public? As Eurovision has a tradition at in Australia, but you know, I always was hearing it, but. Sometimes when we talk to each other and with other countries, we have different, you know, in our country, you know, the passion for European can be something very different than in Australian, in Australia. How is it Australia? How the public takes Eurovision and how it's changed over time? Because it probably has some more impact nowadays. Yeah, look, um, so SBS, the, the network, we work for um we've been screening eurovision since 1984 yeah. um so the network uh, our network was set up we're a public broadcaster with a number two public broadcaster but our whole charter and our whole purpose is around diversity mm -hmm. and multicultural um uh, multiculturalism and uh, around global sort of issues and so we've always always shown eurovision since since 19 84 um and then then there was a period because we took the bbc feed so we had terry wogan um oh, yeah. and so a lot of australians grew up with the with the uk commentators and then about 10 years ago or 11 years ago we sent our own commentary team for the first time um and and it really did sort of change it then because we had this australian positive um, vibe this australian context What's that? Oh, I said just positive vibe. It just, you know, always reminds me of Terry Morgan that really didn't really help Eurovision in the UK and other English speaking countries. Absolutely. Yeah. No, no, I agree with you. And, and, um, so we, in many ways, we sort of always had a slightly comedic view of Eurovision, but we also just loved it, you know? And then, um, once we were invited to compete, like Australia was over the moon because one, the idea was so kind of silly in itself. Like we're on the other side of the world. What, why are you in, in Eurovision? We still get that question asked all the time. Um, uh, and so then the audience started to change. And, and what, what was important is that once you're competing in it, you have to show it live. And so live Eurovision for us is 5am in the morning. Um, and, 
So over the last seven years, what we've seen is what we still show the live show because we have to so that people can vote. Um, but we also do a primetime repeat where we add uh, some additional links and interviews and backstage, um, you know, fun. Um, so we still show that. But um, and what we would do often is program that on a Friday, Saturday and Sunday night. Okay, so, it so it's would like a be long last semifinal event. one on the Friday. Yeah. Yeah, so Eurovision weekend, and so people will um, go away for their holidays or book a weekend, uh, you know, down the coast with their friends and basically have a Eurovision weekend party, uh, and people love that. Um, but what we've noticed since we have been doing both is that we now have more people, that the audience is shifting to the live, to the 5 a.m., and, um, and that's incredible because in Australia, traditionally, the only audience that will get up at five o'clock in the morning are people who want to watch international sport. So we've got, um, so, so we've got all of these people getting up to watch Eurovision. And so now it's about 50, 50, we get about half the audience at the live show and half in the primetime show. And I reckon a lot of those audiences that may be the same people, but, um, but that's, what's really changed for us. And, and in, in our, in our primetime broadcast, we, um, we uh, we have a lot of tweet, tweet, um, tweets on screen. So we have this whole sort of Twitter conversation um, and that's become a real tradition in Australia. And, you know, Eurovision is in the top 10 um, entertainment hashtags every year. Um, and it's, as we all know, Twitter goes nuts for, for Eurovision. But, um, but I think that is bringing the fans in as well. So we've always had this sort of, you know, we talk about collaboration. We've always had this collaboration with the fans as well. Um, and that's via, you know, it's probably started with the hardcore fans getting up at five o'clock in the morning, which is a weird experience, but it's, it's kind of cool. Um, and then following that through the weekend. So yeah, that's, that's kind of how it's changed and it's become more, more and more, um, more and more popular, I guess. So more, more people like, uh, you know, the, all the news networks cover it. Um, and what I'm noticing, I mentioned triple J earlier, which was the, the radio network, which is Australia's biggest radio network. Um, they play, they're playing Montaigne, uh, our artists this year, you know, and, and we get a lot of interviews on that. Now that, that would have been unheard of 10 years ago. Um, and, do I think Eurovision's gone more towards that alternate or do I think that the Gen Z's come more towards us? I, I'm not sure, but I just think that there's a love and affection and a respect for Eurovision in Australia that was probably quite different to how it would be in the UK. And I use the UK as an example because they're English speaking. Um, uh, yeah. Um, so uh, yeah, I think it's an interesting comparison. Um, uh, like, and, and look, let's be honest, we, we, we're still guests. We, we, we've only been doing it for seven years. We still love it. And we still, we still want to be in it for another 40 years if we can. Um, but, um, yeah, as I, and I think the key for that is for us to continue working with good artists, putting on a good show and most importantly, you know, working with you guys, like, um, working with the EBU, working with, the broadcasters and, and um, doing what we can to challenge each other and, and to support each other and to put on a good show. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That just, you know, appeared in my mind, but what was the, like the biggest shock when you came to European TV industry from the Australian TV industry, which probably differs in some points or, you know, culturally different. Like what was, what, what, what was the thing for you in Lisbon? Like when you came, like we would do it, Egg, like very different like you couldn't say this in australia you know like what like was there any kind of shock or or that are those two worlds actually very close to each other they just don't recognize it sometimes do you, do you know what the biggest shock to me was is that um eurovision is such an incredible show it's such a big show it's such an expensive show and then when you go to one and you get to know the other heads of delegation and you get to know the producers and you get to know the EBU and you realize these are really nice people. Um, and they're very talented people. And 
it's sort of you realize how um it's a, it, at heart it's actually it's a massive show but it's always a relatively small team mm -hmm. putting these things together and so my biggest shock i guess was how great everybody is <laughs> um and how talented people are I, I i don't know if that makes sense but it's and just how accessible and welcoming people are and you can yeah, you can just work together to put on something that's seen by so many people. Um, I just, I guess how down to earth people are. And I think, you know, I think that's, that's my biggest, that was my biggest shock. And I think it'd be slightly different to, you know, I have done some work in America and, and the Americans um, are a little bit sort of, um, I don't think, how do I put this? They are more hierarchical. Uh, mm -hmm. And so, you know, they, th things are tougher, I find, in the American approach. Um, and so, yeah, I just find the European approach to Eurovision just so, yeah, warm, and welcoming and no nonsense. And, and it changes every year, to, depending on what country is. Like Lisbon's is very different to Tel Aviv, That's which right. is very different to Rotterdam and... And I, I kind of love that. And I don't know, as somebody who, who gets a great deal of joy about visiting other countries and traveling the world and meeting people from different cultures, like, uh, it's just awesome. <laughs> it's just great. Like, I love it. Yeah. yeah, yeah. For me, it was the same. Like, I, it really opened my eyes as well in the way how people are kind of same anywhere in the world, you know, especially the people from this industry who are yeah. doing the, exactly the same job as you do. And somehow very similarly maybe different conditions but you know the the talent as you said or you know the passion towards what they do that what i always like 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 wow wow yeah. wow that that's really infused me always with the passion for for the job as well i wanted to you know it pushed me forward how that pushed you forward in some limits you have you said about the inspiration to the to the australian the sides as well but maybe there, there's another topic which is very important, and you mentioned it as well, the Generation Z or even the younger generation. Uh, how do you feel that this is very important for the future of maybe not just the music industry, for the TV industry, but for the, you know, uh, how to say it, for inspiration uh. of this generation, what this diversity, but as well sharing means? Oh, look, it's a great question. And, and I think uh, from a television point of view, so so in my job, I, I as well as Eurovision, I look after all, all the entertainment and uh, shows at, at SES. Um, and all over the world, uh, television audiences are declining on, on the traditional measure on, on watching uh, overnight television because everyone's watching Netflix or, or on YouTube or whatever it might be. So that's the same the world over. Um, but when it comes to the Eurovision Song Contest, I think it's different because um, it, it, it's ever changing. It, it, it continues to grow. It continues to change. Um, music is always going to be around. And, and you can see it with the stars from, from all the countries sending different um, types of artists. Um, also having a different approaches to national finals. Um, and look, and anything that we do in television these days, you can't just make a television show. You have to make, uh, you have to have a social strategy. You have to have TikTok videos. You have to have um, live tweeting. You have to have, you know, all these secondary assets, we call them. Um, so as long as we continue to do that, I, I don't think the Eurovision Song Contest is going away in a hurry. And I think its biggest strength is the engagement and the fan engagement and the blogs and, and the fan blogs and, and, and the reaction videos. And, you know, so as long as you're having that conversation, um, yeah, I don't, I can't see the Eurovision song contest going away anytime soon. Um, and I think more and more, you have to remember the roots of the Eurovision song contest, which was in, in post-war Europe, which was about bringing together and, and after a pandemic, um, that's why I'm so looking forward and so disappointed that we can't actually be there in person this year. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think the reason for Eurovision 
is more important than ever before because the world is very fractured at the moment because we can't, in many cases, physically see each other. Um, but you can come together for, for an awesome, fun competition and TV show that's got high production values and, you know, so... So when it comes to broadcast television, yes, I think there's problems. When it comes to the Eurovision Song Contest, no problem at all. Yeah, and <laughs> I really see this approach of the younger generation that they're very more accept. Like they, as you say, they're watching Netflix, YouTube, YouTube, HBOs, whatever, you know, on stream platforms, you know, that TV. But when it comes to big shows, the the numbers are there even bigger. Of course, it's pandemic times, probably it as well the reason. But somehow it yeah. shows over the years, even the countries like Czech Republic, that if you're just put a good entertainment show on TV, the people will watch it. So uh, how does yeah. this work in Australia? It maybe shows that the TV is not that, but it's just a good addition to anything else with the good program. How how SBS actually reacts as a public broadcaster well, to those changes? As we all know, in Europe, it's a big example of it that television's public broadcaster kind of are slower to, you know, inherit all of those new things oh look i think um one of the things i think when it comes to television is well one it's the the making sure you've got a good streaming service so uh, our networks put a lot of effort into our what we call sbs on demand um so you have to have that when it comes to entertainment to me nothing beats live like um because live live television as you know, it's incredibly fun and stressful to make, but people, but there's, I call it a campfire television because everybody comes around the campfire mm. and together. And so, um, so I find live TV very important. The other thing I find important, which is what our network does is, um, is purpose. So, um, We, we are the smallest network in Australia, but we have a very strong purpose. So when it comes to the content that we produce and commission, we have a very strong documentary um, uh, commissioning slate and, and they are all often around sort of serious social issues. Um, so that's kind of our purpose is around diversity and purpose. Um, that's not to say... I don't love a good reality show, mm -hmm. <laughs> but um, Australian television has a lot of reality shows. Yeah. Um, but I think people will always look for something different. And so, uh, yeah, I think it's about, I think it's about defining yourself and your network brand and, and, um, and purpose. And that's, that's kind of what, That's what our approach is as a network. Yeah, and do you think that is, this is the strength, the biggest strength actually of public broadcaster that they can afford to find a purpose or a higher purpose of think as Eurovision is kind of higher purpose or maybe a national selection is a higher purpose because it just don't have this goal, just we want people to watch it, but we of course want to people to get inspired or to see the diversity, which I would say the higher purpose. Do you think that this approach is luck in the industry and maybe as the numbers are right like dancing in the stars has or the strictly come dancing i don't know how we call it in australia uh it has as well the higher purpose than just the show itself even it's one of the biggest shows and it shows by numbers so do you think that the tv actually don't see this how important purpose actually is and maybe it will bring people back to televisions even in more numbers than we can imagine do you think this is the one of the part of the crisis of television that it lacks purpose? I think people are always going to consume content, right? Sure. So so it, whether you're making a documentary or a drama or a reality show, people want to watch that content. What will disappear eventually is the, um, the antennas on our roof, you know, like um, I think more and more uh, traditional networks um, probably... Oh at some point we'll probably all go completely uh, digital, completely via the internet. I mean, I think it's inevitable. Um, so it's about, again, that's where brand definition comes in. Like it's about, I mean, I'm not sure what it's like where you are, but um, you know, there'll be a, an American show or a, or a British show or something um, that might be terrific. Like 
the handmaid's tale i don't know if you get that yep. in in where you are but so that we show that on sbs um but we we show it first and then the other the the prior series are on uh one of our streamers um in australia so so i think it's about um defining your brand and people will find that content um somehow <laughs> but i think yeah I, I think it's about curating the content and defining your brand and purpose um and i think you know one of the things about eurovision is that uh public broadcasting can at times uh, the world over have a reputation for being a little bit old-fashioned i guess um but the eurovision song contest is oh created by the EBU, which is a union of public broadcasters, and it brings in a huge young audience. And so you're constantly bringing in this younger audience to public broadcasting who then you have the opportunity to promote your other shows that you might have coming up. And then hopefully those younger viewers will start to value public broadcasting, mm -hmm. um, which I think is incredibly important for, for all of us um, to maintain. So. Again, I don't know if I answered your question then, but um, uh, I think, yeah, it's all about making good content. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, like, you know, it maybe was a hard question as well. That's more like my vision. And that's maybe as well the good question. What is your vision towards the Eurovision? Like, do you think that to have a vision towards it, to have a long term goals is important? And what is it? To win it. To win it, but well, that's a goal itself, you know. That's a goal itself. I well, that's great. That's a great goal. Actually, I love it when somebody just and then what I always like at Australians at you guys that you weren't afraid to say it out loud. You never, you never did to. You, oh, really? you were never worried to say like we want to win it. Even weren't you sure that you did you that you would it as a mirror, but you will say like we're confident in winning the contest. Like we really would like to do it, and then I really like. To see, as this is a, I think that's a really healthy approach. You know, like it's a contest eventually, anyway. So, uh, so that's a great. But, but what's your but, vision towards the contest as a head of delegation? Where would you like to see it? Where would you like to see your national selection in the future? What, what would you like to achieve with it? Look, for us, it's always about. Well, there's two things. I mean, we, we continue to grow Eurovision. Like we feel, we still feel like we're in the bit, the early days of our journey, even mm -hmm. though we've shown it for nearly 40 years, but we've been competing for seven years, I think. Um, we have introduced our own national final of which we've only done two. We want to continue um, growing that um, for the Australian music industry. Um, and how cool would it be to win it? You know, like, I, I mean, <laughs> I don't get me wrong. I think that's incredibly, incredibly hard to do. Um, we often joke that our, we, we, I don't know if I should say this, but we often it. joke that our <laughs> ideal, <laughs> our ideal result is coming second because, um, you know, when you come second, which we have done once, um, the problem with winning Eurovision is that is the, the, the cost of staging it. So, <laughs> um, so you still feel like you've really done well, but, but you don't have to pay for it the final, the, the next year. But, um, no, but honestly, I mean, we would love to win it one year. We would love to do that. I mean, to, to, the opportunity to not only, uh, do what a host broadcaster do, like, I, I know it would be stressful, but, um, we, it is all about the ideas and, uh, you know, the idea that we could, um, work on, it'll be once in a lifetime opportunity, you know, yep. unless you're Sweden or one of these countries, it's one of a few times. <laughs> yeah. But um, it can eventually it's, change, it's, you know, you never know. It depends when you lost the pace and somebody else will just go there. So it can be Australia as well. Yeah. So we would love to win it. And, and that would be our, oh, of course that would be our goal. I mean, I, I, I don't understand why that's maybe I'm missing some, uh, European, um, <laughs> uh details here but yeah no you don't i think that's the the, the other just, cultural confidence you just got you know i don't know maybe that's maybe that's it i like it but to being second actually that was our goal always like it was a running joke we weren't second and you know we were close in 2018 i think 
but uh, the the point is that like we're like everybody's kind of afraid to hosting it because of money, but eventually they all do, and yeah. I think it's a super big prestigious event for the whole broadcaster. Even you know it it will push the limits of all the workers and, and you know creators there as well because they have to just somehow deal with it, and I think that's great as well. What would what? Oh look, our dream would be. Our dream would be to host it in Australia. That would be our ultimate dream. Um, that's currently not uh, our uh, arrangement. We would host it in Europe, but um, yeah. But if you just do so, it in so Australia, I will about... probably should as well pay the other delegations to do it because they probably couldn't afford the cost of traveling there and living there as well. <laughs> However, we do have a good exchange rate, so the euros uh, would be favourable in Australia. We can afford <laughs> more, but um, anyway. So yeah, one day, one day, one day. I'll, I'll have to try to convince the the reference group and and um, and Martin, um, the head of ESC, to to see if we can do that one day. <laughs> yeah, that would be awesome. That would that would be really because Jonola really... was no. No. <laughs> yeah, but not anymore there, you know, he's other other things to work on now. So that was the different focus, Swedish focus, maybe that's a bit different, but just just that's just joking. But let tell me one one last thing. What way, if it's up to you, what way would you like to see Eurovision in the future? Is there anything what you miss or the country you would like to invite if it's up to you? Because when I'm talking to Cla Paul Clark one day, he told me like he really would like to see China in there. You know, it's like, like okay, wow, that's that's wow. Like I wouldn't even you know think about this country, but it's much closer to you than than for us in Europe as well. What vision for Eurovision would be yours if you can influence it really huge? Oh, uh, look, uh, yeah, it's a very good question. I mean, we spent uh, a number of years uh, trying to uh, get uh, Eurovision Asia up. Um, uh, it was very difficult. And I noticed that, you know, the team are working hard on the American Song Contest. Um, so I, it's a difficult one because um, 40 countries, it's usually 40, 41, like it's a big show. So if it were to get any bigger, uh, you would, you would have to change the way it's done. I mean, there's always been a goal to have a, a, a global Eurovision. Um, but maybe there's a way that you have a, a Eurovision Asia and an American song contest and, uh, traditional Eurovision. Maybe there is a way to pull all those pieces together. I don't know how, I think, um, you know, China, China was, is an interesting idea. I think, um, I like the idea of Canada. I mean, Canada mm -hmm. often, I, I see a lot of fans in Canada go, it's like, um, you know, your brothers and sisters going, well, Australia get to be in it. Why can't we? And so, um, I think if you're going to grow it to more and more countries, you have to either introduce more semis, um, and then it, Maybe there's a third semi-final, you know, maybe there's a semi-final three and then the grand final is even bigger. I mean, I think that would be an interesting first step. Mm. Um, so, uh, and I'll be, yeah, but so I just don't know. I'd love to see it grow more and more. And I think it's important to always understand, again, the origins of the Eurovision Song Contest, which was bringing people together after, you know, World War Two. And so I think that, yeah, maybe the maybe COVID nineteen is a good uh, excuse to grow it to uh, to to more and more countries. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I would like to see the idea, especially to growing the idea of Eurovision, as you said, as I really feel sometimes that the oh, I know, I know. Yeah, kind of come on. I just thought Japan or Korea, K pop or J pop, I think would be amazing. You know, and I think that would just be. It would work. I'd love to see those two countries. Yeah. Yeah, me too. Maybe as an interval access first, as Australia were starting in 2015 like this as well. And, you know, look where you are right now. Absolutely. Like a huge part of the community. Exactly. I see it as, as well like this. Especially in this fragmented world, I really see how important it is to have countries which aren't in Europe. Actually, you're not the only non-European country in the contest anyway. Just very far yeah but i'm really glad that you're in europe not in america actually that we have you and i know you and i had the privilege to know you and as well i'm really glad that you take this part of this interview of humans of eurovision 
her 25th man that's really means something that's really anniversary you know and uh <laughs> i'm really glad that you're here with me oh, thank, thank you very you. much Josh, for having you thank you Jan. thank you very much and uh, yeah no thanks and congratulations on a, on, on a on a great channel and um yeah it's been the last time i saw you was in rome in a pre-covid world um and that just seems like a different world of way but i hope um you know i hope before too long um we can be back on the same continent <laughs> that was josh martin the head of delegation of australia so i'm really curious what do you think about his answers what do you think about my questions what do you think about his whole interview and what is your conclusion of this interview is there anything you would like to know more is there anything you don't care about how do you think about the australian music and tv industry how do you think about their national selection and what do you expect from 2022 do you have any tips for the artists and did you encourage some of them to join in well let's discuss in the comment below don't forget to like the video don't forget to share the video don't forget to subscribe the channel god why haven't you done this yet actually that's the question i'm questioning it well i'm really glad that you watch through here i'm really glad that you're watching and listening to this podcast interview humans of eurovision i'm glad that you're here with me i really appreciate it and i see you next time thank you guys bye